So, fire away, Michael. Okay, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. You just reminded me, um, yes, how many years I have, um, I have actually uh, kind of been looking at Lydiard and still learning. And, um, and we have other projects in terms of the architecture and understanding what's going on um, going forwards as well. But we're here tonight to talk about um, uh, the remodeling of Lydiard, or as um, John Sinton called it, the rebuilding uh, in the 1740s. So I'll just click. What? Let's get going. So let's. Can everyone, is everyone seeing that? Okay. Ooh, we'll about yes. That. Sorry, start from the beginning. So, um, this is uh, uh, a picture, uh, a watercolour by John Buckler, um, dated about 1810. Um, and it's mainly of uh, St Mary's Church, which is um, behind uh, the mansion. Um, but you can see um, what Lydiard House used to be like. And we don't have much evidence of what Lydiard House was like before um, the rebuilding, um, mainly because the, um, the, the family archetype has, was lost in the 20th century. So pretty much everything that I talked to you about tonight um, has been gleaned really from really investigating the, the, the built architecture there and also uh, various documents from other archives, but, but really from a lot of observation. Um, so some of it is conjectural, but um, I think it does give us a, a fair idea of the story and and possibly what went on in, in actually um, producing the wonderful house that we, we have there today. Um, the other major piece of evidence we have is this drawing from the, the 17th century, uh, which shows uh, the main house and also a wing uh, running down the left of um, servants' houses and stables. Um, and if you can uh, think of what you know as Lydia today, um, pretty much the, the face of that big building you see is, is the house that we have today. Um, it's kind of in a strange place, this building, because it, it, it's, it's a Jacobean house that was essentially, I think, a Tudor building, which was being remodeled anyway. So those very tall windows you see are probably an attempt to kind of bring a little bit of classicism to the house. Um, what uh, we all think is that that centre bay, which is indented in the house, is probably a two-storey kind of hall, and then there's various bits of accommodation arranged either side. Um, and the walls to uh, where the roofs are, you can see the roofs actually kind of go behind the walls, so there's obviously been a parapet built as well at some point, just to try and regularize and, and already want to make it a sort of classical house, but it, it never quite is. Um, and also notice that uh, you know, the park is quite different. So in the foreground of the house, uh, we have a series of walled gardens, um, all for pleasure and leisure. Um, and from the little plan at the bottom, and of course this is all fragmentary, but we see that there's there were probably another series of walled gardens with divided into parterre leading down to what we know today is the lake and the lake was itself then a much more rectangular uh, sometimes described as a pond but obviously a substantial body of water but much more formal and it was this house that uh, the St. John's uh, inhabited it loved as their country seat um, right up into the, the early part of the 18th century. But of course, um, times have changed quite dramatically and uh, it was unfashionable, it was probably uncomfortable and it, it wasn't really appropriate anymore for the status that the St. John family thought they were, they were about. There are many uh, famous and interesting uh, members of the St. John family uh, through history, but probably the one that um, still is uh, read and remembered most is, is Henry St. John, there on the left, uh, who um, had risen to fame and uh, high office under Queen Anne at the beginning of the 18th century as a Tory minister in different portfolios and involved very much in negotiations with the French uh, for the treaties 
that um, finished the war with Louis XIV. Um, and then in 1714, Queen Anne died, and uh, the whole country really was trying to work out who was going to carry on the succession and, and who to back, whether it was the Jacobite cause from Scotland or whether the House of Hanover under George I would prevail. And um, Henry, uh, being an astute politician and uh, uh, kind of backed both sides at different times, but eventually sided with the Jacobite uh, cause coming out of France. And of course, he backed the wrong horse. So he had to uh, flee from England and uh, spent some years in exile in, in France um, until he was pardoned in 1723 and was able to return a few years later, but uh, not able to participate in public life and, and pretty much disgraced, as were a number of other people. But, uh, and the family perhaps wasn't as um, eminent then as it perhaps thought it should be. Uh, and then contrast uh, Henry with his younger half-brother, some 33 years younger, John, who's in the centre there, uh, young, uh, energetic, uh, connected in society, and probably a rising star, not of the magnitude of, of a politician that, that Henry was, but uh, someone with aspirations and uh, someone who wanted to uh, make back perhaps the family name. Uh, and his marriage to Anne Furness, who is on the right, uh, helped cement that energy and provided him with a substantial dowry from her father to you know, help improve his status and the status of the family. And they together um, started that off with a new house in London, where they probably spent a good deal of money. Um, and as time went on, uh, both brothers' father was still alive. Uh, there were negotiations about that. There were negotiations about Lydiard because it was long neglected and it was probably everyone thought needing modernization. And so a, a project was hatched to, to do something about that. And um, what with some of the money from Anne's dowry, but luckily her, or unluckily her father died in 1733 and left her half his fortune, uh, which was very substantial, Unfortunately, later, uh, very soon after her brother died also, and so all the family money came to Anne. So it, it placed John in a very good position to do something with Lydia. So Henry made over the, the house and the estates to his, his brother in 1738. Uh, and so it was ready for a, a major building project. Um, the exact dates of the building project are we, we don't really know, but um, we, there is a plaque in the roof space of the house, which says that the building was rebuilt in 1743. Whether it was actually finished in 1743 or begun in 1743 is difficult to know. And there are different academics that talk about the dates, but needless to say, uh, the work was undertaken. And uh, as the plaque testifies uh, and acknowledges, much of the money came from Anne's inheritance because her father is mentioned in pretty substantial terms there. So the country was changing uh, in moving towards the middle of the 18th century and, and becoming a lot wealthier, but also politics and architecture were changing uh, dramatically under the, the Georgian kings. Um, and a particular style of architecture re-emerged that had been first introduced in the, the first half of the 17th century by an architect called Inigo Jones, uh, who had studied uh, the work of another architect called Andre Palladio, who uh, became renowned in Italy a century earlier for building country houses for the wealthy, particularly around Venice and in the Vianetto. Um, and his, his, his success was based on the idea of, of taking sacred classical forms from antiquity and using them to decorate and enhance uh, villas for the wealthy elite in Northern Italy, uh, and almost giving them a sense that they were gods almost in themselves. Uh, 
And there are quite a, a group of architects that were involved in, in these kind of designs in Northern Italy, but Palladio was much more successful at publicizing himself. And he wrote uh, a substantial treatise contained in four books that was published and disseminated so widely across Europe that um, when Inigo Jones went to Italy to study, Palladio was the first on his list. Um, and he was heavily influenced by his work. Um, the, um, the Commonwealth intervened in that process with, the, um, with Charles I being deposed. Um, and when Ring England came back to sort of a normality in the second half of the 17th century, it was a much more lucid Baroque style of classical architecture that uh, most patrons were involved with. Um, but it was the discovery by uh, Colin Campbell and others of Inigo Jones, um, who he studied in considerable detail and published more works that led to the kind of reintroduction of the Palladian style as we would, we would know it today. And, and the picture here is of Croom Park, which uh, is later than the idiot, 1751, designed by Capability Brown, who not only did landscape, but did architecture as well. And I put it up really because it, it contains perhaps the archetypal elements of a Palladian country house in terms of an English interpretation. Um, and it, it, they're different from the Baroque because they're much more structured and simpler. Uh, they're not as fluid and, and, and easygoing. So it's quite a, uh, a sort of, not observing, but um, kind of rigid style of design. And it refers again and again, not just back to Palladio, but what Inigo Jones had, had been developing a century earlier. Um, and the elements really are um, the bulk of your house, uh, which then has a classical temple front in the center, uh, comes in different forms, but that's to, to emphasize the, the entrance. Um, and then you'll see that there is a kind of very small basement level, uh, which we would sometimes nicely refer to as the lower ground floor um, or the rustica. And it's often very rugged in the way the stonework is elaborated on it, not so much on this house. Um, and as a commentator has said, this, this floor level below ground almost is, is dedicated to hunters, hospitality, noise, dirt and business. It is where the, the, you know, the, the mechanism of life takes place. It's where the kitchens are. And then the actual living, the, um, the place of taste, expense, state and parade is elevated to what we would call the first floor, but a classical architect would know as the ground floor. And it's there where the patron lived and where a polite conversation, where culture is celebrated, art, and all the architectural elaboration is put. And then the, the floor above and the floors above, the attic, attica, are often the bedrooms and further up the servants' bedrooms. And you know, whatever classical building you look at, this precedent is pretty much followed in one form or another from the Palace of Versailles to you know, uh, uh, St. Petersburg. Um, but g going back to the Palladian formula, the corner towers also are a particular uh, design element that appear in, in Palladio's books and are followed through quite con consistently by the Palladians in one form or another. And it's this uh, assemblage of architecture and form and design that John wanted for his house that would uh, restore perhaps some of the family seat, but also the family name. So just to um, a little bit of background, but classical architecture, really the, um, the framework of it is the classical order. And there are various treatises written over hundreds of years that uh, describe different proportioning and, and different arrangements. But it's generally agreed that there are five orders of architecture. And when I describe them, you'll see that there really are three. Uh, but the, the whole of the building is proportioned and uh, put together from one single dimension. And that dimension is the diameter of the classical column at its base. And every single piece of ornament, every relationship of a window to a door is ordered by that diameter. So the diagram here shows you the number of diameters that say at the column or elements of the classical order um, are driven by. 
So, and the classical order itself consists really of three things. There's the plinth, the base, which you can see. Um, there's the column itself, which has different decorations on the capital, which also have different meanings. And then there's the entablature, which is the kind of beam bit on the top, um, which has different forms of decoration and is topped by a cornice. Uh, and it's this device that orders absolutely everything in the classical house. Uh, and it's that uh, uh, need for order, it's that need for structure that classical buildings are about. And they're in contrast really to, should we say, houses before the classical period, which are much more cumulative, uh, much more additive, asymmetrical, and uh, the forms are more organic. The classical building is very, very rigorous. So um, how was this to be achieved at Lydiard? Because um, we don't know for sure, but um, there is some referencing to the fact that um, John and Anne were pretty stingy. Um, and I think that stinginess really stemmed from the fact they didn't have a lot of money or the building work just cost far more than they thought. Um, and so they, they wanted a great classical house, but obviously couldn't afford it because what you normally do is just demolish the whole building you had and recite often into a different location. But um, the budget, I don't think would allow. So they called on the services of an architect called Roger Morris, uh, who we think was the architect here. Uh, and we know that John had visited numerous country houses that um, Roger Morris had been involved with. He was a very rigorous Palladian and stuck fairly rigidly to the ideas that had been passed down to him by a, another architect called Colin Campbell um, from Inigo Jones's sketches and drawings. And we'll see that when we talk a little more detail about the house. So uh, he was faced with a, a kind of old mansion, which he had to reuse and somehow um, give you the impression of a classical building of great wealth and fashion, but um, to a budget. Uh, also, the, the builder architect, Nathaniel Erickson, was imported from Somerset because he'd worked on various other classical houses uh, that friends of the, um, the St. John's knew, uh, and he could also help. And, and John St. John actually writes in a letter at one point, you know, during the construction works. He's, he's concerned about cost and, and worried about the brickmakers in, in Wooden Bassett overcharging him and, and fiddling the number of bricks that were delivered. Uh, so, so anyway, what we have here in front of us is the plan of Lydia. This is the, the kind of the, the big classical mansion bit that we know. Where the north point is on the top left, there is obviously a wing that goes off, um, which is the, the servants' quarters that has been remodeled as well at a different time. Um, but I want to concentrate really on the, the kind of the stateroom element of the house and the, the very dark shading of the walls, as you can see, it, that's the earliest part of the house that's left. So um, that's probably from the Tudor period and into the, into the 17th century. Um, and of course, nothing quite lines up. It's not quite square. Um, and there are bits and pieces that are retained to you know, make the scheme that uh, Roger Morris has designed work. And then the kind of middle grey walls, they are what we think of as the as 17th century work, probably carried out by um, Henry and John's father, um, with sort of different additions added and, and remnants of pieces. And, and what Roger Morris uh, sort of designs is, is a, an, a, a facade, which the lighter colour um, stonework wall shows, that kind of wraps around the building across all these kind of different shaped rooms and tries to regularise the whole thing into one simple symmetrical form. Um, and you can see the arrangement of rooms there. Um, interestingly, the, the parallelogram shaped uh, plan isn't really discernible on, on the floor. So when you're there, so, you know, the architect and the builder kind of knew what they might just be able to get away with to make this thing work and, and appear as it should. And of course, um, there it is. There is the, the facade that wraps around two sides. And it gives you the impression of um, a house with a fourth tower that actually everything inside there is a great block of rooms. It's giving you the impression that, um, like a stage set, 
that it that it is really a substantial house um, and of course it sits as this pristine object in the park the park itself was also being remodeled at the time and we're not sure about the extent of of what the project was beyond um, but all those walled gardens were swept away and the the formal canal as i'll call it was softened up a bit with landscaping and around the edges to give it that naturalistic look which was to be in strong contrast to this very classical house and so we arrive at the at the at the entrance and um you can see that the the building is 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 symmetrical so it's part of that rigor uh but we don't have the classical portico the 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 temple and the classical columns would have been expensive but that said the center portion uh is framed and built as if those columns were there it's implied and that in this instance is is just as good and of course we have the towers on the ends also following that that palladian tradition um, but we don't have the, the, the rustica, the lower ground floor, but the plinth base is emphasized just to try and, and bring the sense that that piano nobly is there. Now, um, you know, this house has been shrunk, I think, a little bit in terms of what we'd normally expect from the classical proportions um, to, to marry into those existing walls. So it's probably a bit three quarter size. And, Unfortunately, the, the, the rooms and the windows don't quite match up always, but that doesn't matter as long as you, you have got this regularity and the eye always wants the regularity. So even if it's slightly off, we're not gonna notice it. Our brains tell us that actually we want it to be perfect. So it leads to uh, kind of a number of sort of eccentricities and, 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 this, and also just further investigation into the kind of details of the building make you realize that things came and went and they probably had money and then some more money arrived and I tell you as an architect working on historic buildings and um, classical buildings the money comes and goes and the, and the and the decisions are changed and and probably the building as originally begun was quite simple and and then you know Mr Morris's ideas for those towers well I think we've just got enough money if we can kind of do it in a slightly different way to, to actually have them please so we get these coins these these bricks on the corners applied onto the ashlar just to define those towers and then you can see the difference in the in the stone of the of the base the two stories of the tower and the top because it was added later um, so there's this changing and, 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 and depending really on the budget. I think you know, there was an architect's design in place, but could we have the whole thing? I don't know. And, it, and it's not uncommon for the process to go like this. And invariably, the first thing to be cut out of the project are the, the gold-plated taps. Um, but here also you see that two of the windows on the ground floor and one on the first floor actually have a, a gray material behind, which is a lead lining. And that's because those windows are not are, are false. Um, and that's, as we'll see on the plan when we move around the building, that's there because you know the windows should work and they should express a room behind, but we're actually having to deal with an existing set of rooms. So it's, uh, it's all a bit of stage setting. Um, and I put the photo on the right, which is a view down the, um, the, the gutter behind the parapet wall at the front looking towards that south tower on the roof and um, in terms of scale and this is what classical buildings do and they are expensive and they're expensive not only because they're ornament and they're built of stone but because they are large so even though Lydia is three quarters size it, it's large and to give you a sense of size of the largeness of things the, um, the balustrade which is on the top there um, you would think that while well, you walk out onto the roof and you can sort of kneel, you can put your arms on and look over out over the balustrade, uh, but it's probably waist height or perhaps, you know, sort of chest height. Well, in actual fact, it's two metres high, uh, which is over six foot tall. So, you know, the scale of these things is, is, is quite substantial. So to achieve that tower, and, and it probably was an afterthought, 
there's, a, there's, some, there's some funny stuff has to go on inside the building as well, because we've already started to roof around the building. Um, so we've got to kind of bring some extra trusses in because the junction doesn't quite work. And then you can see from this kind of model that um, that top story of the tower has to be superimposed over the top to get the thing to work. And if you go up inside the roof space, you'll see these amazing trusses all doing their dynamic to work to keep the roof in place and this stone and brickwork and then you know the side walls are made of timber and it really is all about frontage for those interested in conservation the the seal work is actually uh, an intervention in the 1950s when the house was rescued from uh, dilapidation and the bottom cords had completely rotted away um, and there's quite a lot of um, these little bits of work inside the roof space to to um, repair things that had, uh, that had deteriorated in the in the 19th century. Um, and so the anomalies carry on with the the southeast elevation. So if you look at the towers and their relationship to the windows in the main body, they're very close to those bits of stonework that were applied afterwards. So you know there's a lot of just fiddling but you know you look at it until i mention it you wouldn't have noticed it works it's a beautiful building but behind it's all what was left over from from the original and it's rather piecemeal and bits and pieces of original architecture are left and uh, corridors and staircases built just to make sure all those rooms work and and this is not really unusual for the georgians in um, particularly in Bath, where if you know the Royal Crescent, the, the front um, crescent is, is rather, is completely consistent and regular. And then behind it's all bits and pieces about, and, and, and quite pragmatic, which is not really what the classical building is supposed to be. So we've arrived at Lydia Park and we, we've come to the main house and, and you and I are guests of, of John and Anne, um, and perhaps we've come to dinner. And the, the park, um, we've, we've kind of progressed around the lake, which has emphasized the size of the house and, and give us a glimpse of this amazing mansion. And we processed up to the front door. Although in reality, um, this was never really ever used as the front, but it would have been the intention. And short of a, a big portico, um, we have the next best thing, which is a pretty elaborate porch. And if you remember the, the five orders or the three orders of architecture, um, they also have a hierarchy to themselves. So we always start uh, in a building uh, in, the in, a, in a sequence whereby the, the lower orders, the Doric, which it is here, um, is the first order of architecture and it's the masculine order of architecture. Uh, and so it's always the one, if you, if you progress to a palace or a sequence of rooms, you will always get first. Um, and here it's got a small pediment and all the detail that you would expect in a Roman temple is, 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 is carved out here. So there is no uh, shortage of money to get the entrance right. Uh, and within the uh, detail of the, of the architecture are uh, the, the ox skulls decorated with swags of flowers, known as Bacranium, there's egg and dart mouldings and patra, which are the discs of floral decorations. And um, this all comes from uh, classical temple design. And it's all about that uh, representing life and death. And we are reminded as we enter almost the house of a God that, that we are mortal, but it's also about the sacred. Uh, so it sets us up for great expectation of what we might see or how we might be received into the main house. And so we go into the entrance hall. And if you go to any of uh, similar, similar houses, Palladian houses, there is always a kind of set formula of the way the house is arranged. Um, and at um, Newton Park, uh, if you go to Stowe, you always go into, or still ahead, you go into a big double height space with a vaulted ceiling that's there to impress you. 
Uh, I did see plans of Lydia years ago, which said this was the ballroom. There was, it wasn't designed for dancing. It's a stone floor. And um, that, that's a kind of something that happens in the Victorian period. This is meant to impress you. It's meant to receive you as, a, as an honored guest to uh, uh, show you the taste, fashion and, and, and expense that the house can afford. Uh, and that's expressed in the architecture as well. Um, going again with a classical ordering is also in this room. So if you remember, you, you saw on the classical orders, all of them, there's a plinth. So the plinth is reflected in the, in the dado or the base line of the room. The classical column is still there, although not actually built in the wall depth. And then the entablature, that beam element of the classical order is in, is actually followed around the room and tapped by a cornice. So always there is this ordering device in the background of the way the interior is, is, is designed and the framework panels and everything relates to that, to a, to a classical order. Uh, the fireplace, which is built in limestone with an overmantel is, uh, is a copy of, um, a design by Inigo Jones, which he did for Somerset House um, in 1636. And as we go through this, you'll find there's lots of these, these kind of references back to Inigo Jones, who was so revered by the, Pallad the, the Palladians at this time, uh, and, and such a talented architect as well, that you know, replicating his, his details and his designs was, was, was not, you know, was, was the thing that, that you did. Um, there is a uh, uh, raised uh, plaster panelling on the walls uh, and uh, various uh, Palladian details in the plaster work um, and, and, and all following through in a kind of tradition almost, but for a, for a, for a new style. Um, you'll see from the plan that there's quite a number of doors and everything has to be symmetrical. So even though three of those doors are actually real, um, the other doors are placed to get the symmetry to work and the symmetry of the doors on the back wall are reflected in the windows on the front. So the whole thing sort of ties, tie, ties together. And there's a, an image of the, of the, um, of the hall. Um, the, the fireplace is, is, is uh, um, dives, sorry, the chimney uh, breast and then its flues dive back into the wall. And this is a particular uh, detail that you find in uh, designs by Roger, Roger Morris. Um, and then around the walls are various consoles which support busts uh, chosen as favorite characters from uh, Roman antiquity uh, by the family. And it's, they're there to, to show off their knowledge of, of, of ancient and uh, culture uh, and to show that one they could afford them. Um, so center of the top of the of the fireplace is Marcus Aurelius and to the left Antonus and Gladiator the other and there are numerous others uh, all with their story and all as conversation pieces for us as the guest uh, as we uh, take perhaps wine with our hosts and and wait for a hearty meal. A lot of the country houses you go to the entrance hall is, is sometimes doubles up as the dining room but that's not the case at Lilliard, where you receive through into, into the next room. Now there is a, a tradition uh, that really comes from France of, of the enfilade, which is the arrangement of rooms on a sequence. So rather than um, uh, Victorian houses where you invariably process along a passageway or a corridor and then go into a room, uh, the Georgian tradition is to process through rooms and the, the grander rooms here are arranged in such a way that the importance and the decoration of the room increases as you process. And if you, it's also a mark of your intimacy or, your, or the honour of the, of the guest if you process further along that route. So it's into the dining room, into the drawing room, onto the bedchamber, and if you are very intimate with our hosts, you might receive it into the closet at the end. So we then um, proceed into the dining room. Uh, and this is another fully designed Palladian room. So the classical order is very much expressed here. And it's the feminine classical order, the Ionic. Um, 
and the detailing and the molding and all the proportions follow from that order. Uh, so you can you can see we've got uh, Morris's favourite detail of the fireplace again, which stops before the cornice, and it and it's a good detail because you don't then have to deal with of the cornice wandering around the the chimney breast. So everything has calmed down. Everything is rational. Everything is structured. Uh, the classical columns form a screen and the door that you see at the back there goes through into the corridor so that food and servants can come through without distracting the guests around the dining table. And invariably they would stand you know, behind that screen. It's not really a screen, but it's implied by the classical order so that they know where they are, where their place is and, and, and who are, are the diners. Uh, and so there's a detail of the Ionic capital, um, and this is in the Roman tradition. So if you, you will see two types of these, the, the scrolls or the volutes are slightly angles off the capital, whereas uh, the Greek tradition is they're very much flattened out. But um, the details that Inigo Jones and Palladio were looking at were mainly Roman. So this is the detailing that, that stems through. And the plaster work is, is getting very elaborate, um, full of floral patterns and shell detailing, um, a great elliptical ceiling detail with a continuous Vitruvian uh, um, um, band around the center. Again, you could, you could go around lots of these blade in houses and you'll see these details occurring again and again. It, it, it's kind of a favorite way of the whole design progressing. But at Lydiard, it's slightly unusual in the fact that um, in, the, um, in the four uh, axes of the ellipse, are these, uh, these details. And um, we get these uh, green men, these, these masks of, of, of leaves, which are really a, a pagan reference, not a classical reference that we would more likely see in a, in a medieval church. Um, and of course he's here because he, he's there to emphasize abundance and, 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 and nature. Um, but unusual, uh, uh, and interestingly, although there is there a preoccupation with the classical and antiquity um, in England at the moment, at that time, there's also a preoccupation with what it is to be English. And so there's a lot of harking back, particularly to King Arthur, to legends and to a certain elements of, 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 of the pagan past, which sort of creep in. Um, and this, 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 is, this is kind of shown here at Lydiard. Um, and, you know, the plaster work is, is, is a little rough and a little uneven, but, um, you know, it, it has its own charm to, to it as well. And the details of the doors and, and, uh, are reasonably consistent, but change and vary as we go through the room. So they will get richer as we progress down that enfilade. Um, but they're all based on, on classical precedents. Again, that egg and dart always occurring, that, that memory of you know whilst we are in life we are in are, are in death um, and uh even the skirting details have these little lotus leaf flower patterns um following round it's all very elaborate and it would have cost a lot of money even then so we kind of enjoyed the the company of our hosts and we've had a marvelous meal and as we as as we are eminent guests, they have taken us to the next stage of the enfilade and invited us into the drawing room. And um, for me, the drawing room is kind of, I suppose, the, the kind of oddest room of the house because it's the one that perhaps the, the Palladian scheme, for whatever reason, um, and, and we never really was fully implemented um, here. And now whether that's because of money or whether it's, it's because our uh, and, and John, unfortunately, uh, didn't survive long after 1743, who knows, but it, I mean, it's still an impressive room, uh, but you can see Anne over there on the bottom left uh, portrait, there, there's, um, John is over the fireplace and his brother Henry is in, in two portraits there. Um, so what we would expect if we go back to our, our classical formula, as you might say, we've got the plinth, that dado, and yes, it is there to protect the wall against chairs, but it's there from a classical architect's point of view to emphasize uh, the, um, 
you know, the classical order. Um, but we've got the cornice around the um, ceiling, but we don't have that band, that entablature that's necessary to make sense of the, the classicism that's going on. Um, but in the centre, we do have a fireplace, again, um, based on uh, designs from Inigo Jones's drawings, um, and probably by the uh, London um, fireplace maker, Henry Sheary, fearfully expensive at the time, um, but beautifully made, and, and possibly Diana there in the, in the centre. Um, but of course, there's this, this red wallpaper, which is from a later refurbishment, and uh, investigations have shown that actually the drawing room actually had um, uh, hand-painted Chinese white wallpaper. Now, I think that may be slightly later than the, the 1843 um, alteration works, but uh, you know, it would have been a, a very, very different room. And of course, uh, there's a detail of the, of the ceiling. And again, this doesn't, quite makes sense. So if you see from the, and I don't know kind of what this red uh, mark is appearing on the images, but anyway, um, I don't know whether other people see from that. Um, you, you can see that the, uh, um, those kind of beam details kind of just crash into the cornice, whereas we'd expect the beam to stand down, we expect the cornice to be run around it, and then the, the masks and the detail of the plaster work would be applied at a sort of lower level. So it may have been prepared or rescued as the, the mask looks more 17th century, um, but somehow something didn't kind of get carried through for the full scheme. Anyway, on the, on, we're now sort of uh, still on that route uh, to uh, the inner sanctum and the door now centers up on the drawing room to, to, to kind of emphasize the importance of where we're proceeding to, which uh, on the plan um, you can see we're just going to be received into the bedchamber, which of course is uh, a room of, of intimacy but um, it's still very grand. And this is not dissimilar to uh, Marble Hill, where Roger Moore created a similar uh, bedchamber, but not quite as big as this. Um, and following that uh, hierarchy of classical orders, we now have the composite order, which is a combination of the Ionic and the Corinthian, which is very, very rich in its detail and in its moulding. So the plaster work gets much more elaborate, much richer, uh, in, in this room, and, it, and it, it, it's almost like coming to an audience with the king. And of course, these bedrooms were always at least one of them on the ground floor because they sort of inferred that actually you could entertain the, the monarch if they came, um, came, came on, a, on a visit, which um, really had gone out of fashion since Elizabeth I on her many progresses, but um, there was still the aspiration there. Uh, and the, the room's importance was, 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 was further added to with all this detail and, and sumptuous moulding. Um, you can't see it, but actually in the ceiling of the screen over the bed, and I've never managed to get a good photograph of it, is actually a, a sunburst with Apollo in the centre. And as a, a learned friend of mine said, well, you know, there's only one reason it's there. He's the solar phallus and he's there to uh, promote impregnation and, um, and, and, and childbirth. Um, you know, so th these details, you know, all have their own uh, meaning and, and, and sense of what they should be. And of course, a, a grand fireplace as well uh, to match. Um, and, and Sarah and I were discussing before this, just the, the chimney breast here, which is, uh, needs to be investigated because it, it doesn't make sense. Although the overmantle and the design of the marble work is, is, is very much that Palladian detailing, but something has happened in the meantime that, that doesn't quite match up with that, that flocked wallpaper. Um, and there's a detail of the, um, the Corinthian column, uh, the composite column, and you can see all the, the egg and dart, the dental details. There are consoles and, and medallions um, and a whole lot of heavy cornicing. Um, and nowhere else in the house is, is, the, is the work so rich and sumptuous. And that's kind of covered also in the detailing of the, uh, the ceiling. Now, um, a lot of the ceiling was lost uh, 
before the, the house was um, rescued. And so what we see is actually the work of uh, Italian craftsmen, craftsmen imported in the 1950s to put back a lot of the plaster work. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's actually um, too smooth. It's too um, accurate. Uh, I'd expect the Georgian to be uh, uh, just a, a softer, gentler, more handmade. But that said, it is a representation of what was there, um, and 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 it, it is bordering on the um, on, on um, different detailing uh, to go through. So we are intimate, we are friendly, and 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 Anne Finesse likes us particularly. And so she then uh, invites us and takes us further on into her closet, which is her private room, which is the, the kind of um, the most intimate room in the series. And it's still very elaborate in its, in its detailing, but of course it's much smaller in scale. Uh, the emphasis here is, is much more on feminine details, but at the same time where the architect is quoting from all sorts of other Palladian houses that have gone before. So the apse and its, uh, uh, demi vault with um, uh, diamond um, divisions is is something that you could easily see at Chiswick House, but picked out and gilded. Um, and uh, the shell motif, you know, again denoting the feminine and the little the, the kind of sweetness of the detailing and the um, gentility of it all it suggests you know it, it, it had to be Anne's uh, private room. But, you know, um, this is kind of repeated in a way uh, in the other direction, because quite rightly, John would have to have his own closet as well. But the uh, time that, place that he'd spend most of his time would be in the library. And so the library itself, uh, a very grand room, but I think, uh, again, a a Palladian scheme that only partly was ever finished. Um, and if you look towards the chimney breast, you know, we don't have Roger Morris's detail where it, it cuts back before it hits the ceiling. Um, and although it, we've got a kind of a quite substantial cornice, the entablature and the detailing is missing there. Uh, the bookcases are contemporary with the, with the remodeling uh, and they have uh, egg and dart detailing uh, and the core and, and, the, and the, um, the corbels that support the broken pediments, those triangular bits in the middle, um, have the singed falcon over them, uh, clasping at the detail. Uh, and and above are busts of famous philosophers, you know, to uh, emphasise the learning of the room. But the overmantel, which is uh, in natural wood, um, again very Palladian in its detailing, doesn't quite fit and sort of the um, the, the bust of uh, Diana right at the top sort of intrudes into the cornice um, and then we have a fireplace below two designs by um, William Kent from about 1725 um, and it's far too wide for the chimney breast but that said it kind of has sort of put together and, and, and made to work as is the detailing on the ceiling. Uh, and the octagonal uh, uh, vaulting and the detailing follows pretty much some of the kind of preoccupations of, of the Palladians at this time, but it's not as deep as perhaps one would think. However, the door casings are followed through and uh, we have a, a raised plinth in the centre with some palm fronds to kind of just uh, emphasise that harvesting of knowledge in a library. Uh, and also the door that then takes us through into uh, uh, John St. John's uh, closet, or as we call it, the antechamber. And this is now two rooms, so you can see by the ceiling that there was originally a wall dividing this down. And um, the fireplace over there, which has also been moved from the corner wall, um, it has ram's heads uh, on as its detailing. So there's these, these kind of little inferences of, of the masculine in those details that tell you it was a, a man's room. Uh, and this is a, a, a 19th century lithograph of the house, which, which kind of captures um, what, one, what they wanted to achieve and, and what was achieved, which is this uh, Arcadian landscape, uh, a, a soft, gentle rolling uh, grassland 
with cattle lowing, with this beautiful, pristine classical object set within it, uh, following the paintings of people like Poussin and Claude, who a century earlier had painted ideas of the idealized uh, classical landscape and buildings from antiquity, which is what the St. John's wanted to achieve. Uh, and as I said, unfortunately, John and Anne uh, only lived a few years after 1743, uh, after spending much time and thought and effort and money to achieve this uh, idealized landscape and, and house. Um, and uh, to leave to a very young son, Frederick, who then unfortunately went on to drink, womanize and gamble pretty much most of the family fortune away. And um, the St. John's never recovered from that afterwards. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Michael, thank you very much indeed for a, a, a really illuminating and um, memorable talk for us. I do apologise if I disappeared for moments as the wind at Roughton took my internet connection down, but uh, hopefully, hopefully I'm making um, a connection with you and, and all our lovely audience um, at the moment. And I think I have come yeah, back on, on the main screen. <laughs> We've got uh, very heavy rain, which is why I put the earphones on. <laughs> One moment. Take it back, sweetheart. Michael, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any sense of, of what the fortune was that the poor lady lost or when they ran out of money? Or can you put any sort of dates around stuff or incidents? It's, it's a difficult one because we know that, um, you know, her dowry was £20,000, which was a lot of money. Um, uh, but whether that was available, really, we don't know. But I, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, because I think her father was involved in banking, that there was a lot of money. But you don't know whether that got absorbed just by the St. John's themselves. Um, you know, you, you know that, that you just don't know where that money went. But it, it, you know, the architecture tells us, um, and there's only one letter really, you know, we, we just don't know, um, that the whole thing isn't fully realised and that there is a budget. So um, why there's a budget and, and where all that money has gone from or what perhaps it wasn't as much, we just don't know. Um, but, you know, from working on classical houses and other buildings, <coughs> it, it is always like that. Um, no matter how big the number. Um, so, so you, you know, it, it, it has not been fulfilled. And, and, and Morris himself, I think, dies in, you know, pretty much, there seemed to be a lot of deaths around that 1750s sort of date. I think William Kent died then as well. You know, um, a lot of people suddenly disappeared and, and that may, it may have been the momentum was lost, I don't know. Um, mm. But Michael, it, it, it's interesting um, because I wonder if that was Lydiard's gain, because when we look at pictures like Croom Court and, mm. and other Palladian houses, um, and I think you mentioned it, that there's a sort of, um, no, sterility is the wrong word, but, but there's something so much more um, appealing, maybe I'm biased about uh, <laughs> Lydia's Park. And, and, and I remember reading Sir Hugh Casson's remarks about it sunning itself serenely like an old gray cat. And, and there's something very comfortable about the house as if you almost sense it's past history in it. Yes. In a way that you don't quite, when you look at the, you know, demolish the building and build from scratch Palladian house. And I'd be really interested to know what you think about that. I mean, I think I think I remember reading um, some papers by the Duchess of Marlborough and, and she didn't like Blenheim. You know, it was a monument. It wasn't somewhere to live. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's that side of things. And, and, and we believe that actually um, houses have have a gender. Um, and the more masculine, of course, the less comfortable and livable it is. It is a, an, an, an expression of ego, whereas the, the feminine is much more nurturing. Um, and Lydia certainly, 
in its detailing, although, I mean, it's not uncommon in Palladian details, is, is really emphasizes the feminine. I mean, you notice most of the masks are, 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 are female, um, and uh, a lot of the details stem from uh, classical temples associated with the female. So, um, and, I, and I was saying to Liz earlier that, you know, we're, we're kind of discovering, or there are lots of talks at the moment about the importance of, of, of the Sinjin women. Um, and I think that probably resonates in the, in the house um, and, and in the architecture. Um, and we, and there, there, is a, there is a train of thought that, that says that, that buildings learn, um, you know, they take on, absorb and, and give back. So that can be very good things and it can also be very bad things. Um, but Lydia has this wonderful atmosphere about it. Um, mm. And I think the fact that it's a set of compromises and it's not the, the textbook piece is, is, is it's much better for that because in actual fact, the Palladian formula was, was replicated a lot and they're just everywhere. And you kind of, I love historic buildings, but you get to the point of thinking, well, you know, I, you know it, it's this again, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not that special. Whereas I think Lydia is. I, I think it is a, a, a charming building and I would really echo your sentiments about some of the Palladian buildings being very masculine. I think I would, would put um, Burlington's Villa at Chiswick in yeah, that category yeah. and, and Lydia very much the, the opposite. But, um, I mean, I think, I think you've got to think of Chiswick very differently because it, it's actually... Um, uh, I can, it, it's a it's a manifesto piece. It's it's a political statement as well as setting a movement up. Um, and I think Chesterfield said, um, you know, it's too small to live in, but too large to hang on your watch chain. Um, he had a big <laughs> country house next door, didn't he, uh, which yes. got demolished. But but yeah. actually, Chiswick was was just a showpiece. Um, so I think that one. But some of the other ones I've been to have been quite cold. Um, but. Uh, you know, that may be not because of the architecture, that may be because of what's gone on there and the people who live there. Um, and that's projecting what they want to project. So um, it may as much say something about the people who've lived there um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the design. And, and, you know, the plaque mentions, you know, half of the plaque is dedicated to Anne Furness and her father. Um, so that's an acknowledgement of where the money is coming from. And, and I think probably she had a big say in all of this. So, um, yeah, you know. It, so she, it, she's it, certainly somebody worth investigating further, isn't she, Anne Fanese, to... Yeah. Yeah, I think she's a bit overlooked. I think you're right. Now, is there anyone else who would ask, like to unmute themselves, or do all unmute yourselves, and, and ask Michael a question? I think... They look like they've had their fill, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> they want to go to dinner. <laughs> okay, well, if, if, if there's no one who'd like to ask a question, I think, I think it's really a testament to how much wonderful information that you've given us, Michael. I really felt as though I was going on that private tour round, round the state rooms, just gutted when the internet cut out and I suddenly was <laughs> <laughs> thrown out of the room. But um, thank you so much um, to give us this talk. We have recorded it, so in due course, oh, it, it will be available um, to the public, but I think it really does add to our knowledge of the development of Lydiard House. And I know that you continue re to research it, continue to investigate Lydiard, and I've no doubt you are going to find more surprises and yeah. more information yeah. as you continue your work. Um, and we'll really look forward to the, the next instalment. Um, but thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you all of you who've joined us. Um, I'm sure uh, you'd all like to give Mike a huge round of applause. Um, so even if you haven't unmuted, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Very, very much indeed. Thank and you. I do hope all of you will join us on our next talk uh, by Lydia.
Nicola Cornick, which I think is going to be so topical for February and Valentine's <laughs> um, and, a, and a wonderful story of romance. So um, mm. I hope to see you all there. But for now, keep safe and well. Lovely to see you and good night. Thank you, Michael. Good night, Sarah. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye, everyone. Michael, that's good. Bye-bye. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not gone yet. I'm not gone yet. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>